Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, I wonder if maybe we should just, uh, folks can go down and introduce themselves. I know it's always sort of odd, you know, with the filmmaker to introduce themselves because, you know, we know <laughs> we're, we're all here for you. But, uh, you know, indulge us. Why don't we just start in the end? I am Kareen Tamasang. I am with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion here at UMass Boston. Hi, I'm PJ Raval, and I'm the director of the film you just saw, Before You Know It. <laughs> My name is Sammy Sass. I work at the Fenway Institute, which is part of Fenway Community Health Center, and I'm a member of the Massachusetts LGBT Aging Needs Assessment Coalition. Um, I want to start first, um, PJ, with a, a quote from I think one of your earlier sort of synopsis of the film, and I know that it's, it's changing and evolving. Um, you've got Magdale on your team now, and so things are, you know, I, I know how he <laughs> operates. Um, but you, you state here that there are an estimated, there are an estimated uh, 2.4 million uh, LGBT Americans over the age of 55, and that LGBTQ seniors are five times less likely to have access to social services um, as compared to their heterosexual counterparts. Um, half as likely to have health insurance coverage and 10 times less likely to have a caretaker if they fall ill. And in response to these inequities in care, LGBTQ seniors tend to turn to each other for solutions. And I'm wondering if folks here on the panel uh, maybe can address the services that you offer and um, how you implement those services. And for you, PJ, I wonder if you, specifically if you could speak to what do you think the public service or good is for, of your, for your film? Um, so with, I'm with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and so far we have worked with the um, Queer Student Center on some, some projects, um, bringing in some speakers. We are looking to work with our OSHA um, Institute for Lifelong Learning. Um, they have a LGBTQ group with that and we're looking to work with them on uh, getting some programs together and services that they have and kind of pulling together because we do realize that we have a large uh, population of elderly students here at UMass Boston. Um, being able to include them in some of the things that we do or have activities for them is something that um, we haven't gone into recently, but that's a discussion that we recently started having out of some of the dialogues, uh, diversity dialogues that we've had on campus. So we're looking to move more into that. Um, I, so Fenway offers right health care, eye care, dental care, et cetera, so medical care that's specifically tailored to um, LGBT communities. And I also uh, work really closely with Lisa Krinsky and Bob Lynn Scott from the LGBT Aging Project, who many of you probably are familiar with. And that's an organization that does training for service providers for LGBT older adults. And in going into um, assisted living facilities or going into meal sites, talking to ASAPs, which are the folks who provide um, meals on wheels and meal sites, et cetera, and talking about a, a, some, an example that Lisa uses really often is she'll go into a group of providers and she'll say, who here has ever worked with an LGBT person before? And no one raises their hand. And she's like, all of you have, and you don't know it. And, and so that's part of the training um, that they give, and so I work very closely with them, so I want to speak on their behalf also, that they're a great organization. Okay, great. And in terms of how does the film benefit this, this community and sure. your, your, your vantage point? Um, for me, I discovered those statistics um, when I first started researching for the idea of this film um, that was published by the Williams Institute. And, and immediately I thought, uh, it's an estimated, right? Because we're, we're looking at people who are out and identified as you know, an LGBT, uh, and clearly that's not everyone in the community. Um, so for me, I, I, I thought about it in terms of these are abstract numbers, so I really wanted to create something where you actually see someone who fits into these kind of numbers. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that I was hoping to accomplish with this film is just give some kind of visibility to um, the fact that I think LGBT seniors are the most extreme examples of ageism, um, discrimination when it mm. comes to age, and, um, and just in general how I think society desexualizes um, senior populations. And one of the things I found fascinating was by saying an LGBT senior, 
I think it, it's almost like the two terms are at odds because if, if society is desexualizing seniors and you're identifying yourself as a sexual identity by saying you're LGBT, then people don't really know what to do with that mm. because it's, it's, you know, they're, yeah, they're at odds with each other. So I was trying to, I wanted to create a film that kind of looks at, at those issues. So that brings me to the next question about, um, I'm curious, uh, that's sort of, so we've talked about sort of like our, our professional sort of investment mm -hmm. um, in these issues um, as filmmaker, as ally, but what about the personal? So I saw, I saw a piece that you did for a Kickstarter, PJ, where you were talking about how you saw in yourself and these other people's stories your own future, and you realize, you know, one day you too will be part of the LGBTQ uh, senior community. And so we, we, you know, for me, it's very clear what your personal stake and investment it is sure. in the film. What's curious to me is that you don't actually insert yourself in the film. You know, you, I mean, you could have very easily made that kind of film where you're the person who takes us on the journey to meet these mm -hmm. people. Um, and maybe you're still edited in the film. Maybe you will. I don't know. <laughs> But I'm curious to hear from the panelists what your personal investment is and connections are to these, these issues. And, um, and I don't mean to like out anybody. <laughs> <laughs> For me, um, it's something I've always been an ally from as long as I can remember. I consider myself an ally to the LGBT population. Um, I see that as I, I personally took to the to the to Dennis a lot and I thought this could be my grandfather or this could be my you know someone in my family or someone <coughs> that I've worked with or someone that I know um, I felt really 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 connected to him in the aspect of just the loneliness and some of the things that he talked about are all things that whether you're straight gay transgendered it's all things that we can relate to nobody wants to feel alone and I I kind of found him being really really alone and not ever wanting anybody to have to feel that way um, I think that's part of the reason that I got into diversity work is wanting everyone to kind of feel like you have someone you can talk to, or have someone that sees you for you as opposed to having to fit in or having to go with the grain, so to speak. So that's what I took from it. And for me, the film was actually inspired by several, several things, several events, but one in particular um, was actually my mother, you know, and... Uh, my, you know, I had started getting into these conversations with my mother about her getting older and her thinking about, at, at the time, you know, retirement and just kind of the challenges, I think emotionally, you know, uh, financially, everything in terms, of, in terms of the aging process. So I did start thinking about um, how I'm not thinking about it, you mm -hmm. know? And then that kind of put me a little bit on the path of why don't I think about it and what are the fears with thinking about um, yourself as an aging being, right? Um, simultaneously, before I started making this film, I was actually volunteering to teach uh, queer youth uh, filmmaking. And one of the things I saw that was just so interesting was, you know, I was around kids who were 14, maybe 15, and I started thinking even when I was 14 or 15, it was very different times. So thinking about people who I had just met who were like 85 versus someone who's 15 being in the same community, I just think that there's so much diversity within that community, and I wanted to create something that could communicate back and forth. So, so for me, part of creating this film was also me exploring my, I don't know, my ideas and thoughts about the aging process and what is involved with that. Um, and exactly that, where will I be you know, when I'm 85, you know, 75? Um, what's in place? for that. And one of the things I think that was so interesting for me making this film was a lot of the themes that I'm looking at are very universal, regardless of age, like the idea of acceptance, the idea of community, and how those things are equally important, if not even more important, at that age. And, and I think for, you know, a general society, it's, you know, there's a lot of emphasis placed on the youth, and I think rightfully so. You know, they definitely need support, and they definitely need our attention, but I think at the same other end of the spectrum, there's also a vulnerability in terms of aging that equally needs that support. So, um, so for me, the personal investment was being someone who's in the middle mm. right now. I feel like I came from that youth. I'm headed towards the other end of the you're spectrum. Not that, you're not that. Old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's like yeah, I want to be. Time. Yeah, and it's like I I want to make sure that there's something there. Yeah. You know. 
Um, I, my personal investment is I identify as a lesbian. I also identify as queer. Um, and I have two lesbian moms. And they, one of them is in her late 60s and the other one is in her late 50s. And so whenever I talk about the work that I do, they're always like, well, can we come to your groups? I'm like, I don't really think you can do that. It's research. That's a confidentiality issue. But um, so that's my personal investment is with my moms and the community that I was raised with. And I really feel like um, lesbians in their 50s and 60s, especially my mom's age, I feel like I was raised in this warm embrace of this community of women in that age group. And so the investment is really the family that raised me. Um, also, similarly, I've been, I'm, I'm very close with my grandparents. And as they are aging and they're in their late 80s, early 90s, um, I think, I think you're right. Aging is something that we don't talk about. And we don't talk about it until that morning when you wake up and you and your partner, you know, both have a cold or you both have the flu and who's going to go to CVS to get the orange juice and like, what do you do when that is right in your face? And that's, it, it's a, as, you know, as much as we talk about it and think about it, I think it's until that moment we don't really get it. And, um, yeah. So I'm curious about, um, I mean, I guess everyone up here has considered what are the best practices for forming uh, LGBT allies or um, uh, I've heard the term gay straight allies and I, I know people who have issues with the word straight, so um, I don't know, maybe you have to help me with the language, but um, part of what's so compelling about your film is what Kareem sort of pointed out is is, and what you mentioned is that the universality of the themes uh, around acceptance, around I think anybody's ability to be able to see in Dennis, you know, like his isolation and that that could be your father or grandfather or somebody who's marginalized for no fault of their own. Um, and I think you, you did such a careful, tender treatment of of uh, conveying that in, in this film. And so it's clear to me that you thought very carefully about that. And I wonder if you could talk about that process. Um, and I wonder if our other panelists could also talk about what are your strategies or best practices for how you go about creating and forming uh, LGBT you know, allies. I, th I think in the process of making this film, one of the things I didn't want to do was be, I, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but there's definitely, I, I knew the film was definitely going to look at several issues. Um, I didn't want to make a film that was going to be issue driven. I wanted to make a film that was going to be character driven, right? That you would just be with someone and see them experience what they're experiencing and in that process understand what some of the challenges are in that process. And again, it was that idea of like, making those numbers less abstract and actually having a face to, to an issue. Um, so for me, it was always kind of that fine line of, uh, you know, being aware of the issues but not trying to make them forefront and just see, you know, uh, how they really emerge in someone's daily life. And I think there's something really powerful about just seeing someone in their daily life. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the real information comes out of. So I don't know if that quite answered your question, but we'll see. We'll, we'll, cir <laughs> we'll circle back if we, we'll circle back if we need to. So for the the others, sort of in terms of how you your what are your best practices for sort of forming LGBT Hello. allies? Um, one of the things that we're currently working on, um, we just completed a climate survey of the entire uh, university. Um, and one of the things that, to me, was a little surprising uh, that we were getting as far as the questions on the, um, on the survey were questions regarding how you self-identify. Um, just even giving people the options of, you know, identifying what, what you were born as for transgendered individuals. Um, just having that option to say, I was born a man, but you know, I consider myself to be a female. Um, I think giving people that option of how they see themselves is an important um, aspect of being an ally. Um, providing a safe space to be able to have conversations, to be able to open, openly discuss certain things, certain issues that um, people might have or concerns that they might have as far as coming out or, 
issues that aren't addressed on campus. Um, I know that the Queer Student Center provides a great space where you know the students come in, they can be comfortable, they can have conversations, they can have dialogues and programming. One of the things that we're trying to do is be more supportive um, of the Q as far as sponsorship of their activities and working with them to partner to kind of create some of the things that they want to talk about. Um, just kind of being open to the different dialogues that come up regardless of sex, gender, and all that stuff. I think there are two really important things that can be done in terms of advocacy and activism for LGBT communities in, in general and elders specifically. And one of them is um, numbers and data because that's what changes policy and that's what gets the higher ups to listen and gets the funding and gets the money. Um, and another one I think is one of the most powerful ways of activism is telling your story. And I think that that's what your film does really, really well. And um, is just th those two things, the, the numbers and the personal story are such a perfect complement. And I really don't think that you can have one without the other. Um, and so I want to thank you for making this film and also say that I, I think those are both really important mechanisms for change and different kinds of change. I agree. And I think it's one thing to see the story of three people. It's another thing to see a statistic which has a huge amount. Right. <laughs> like a huge amount, because you would never, I mean, I think some people have already watched this film and when the, you know, in the end credits, I have it dedicated to the estimated 2.4 million. And I think mm -hmm. it, it surprises a lot of people because yeah. they haven't thought about it. So I think it is important to see both. Yeah. So, um, so PJ, I, this is a question for you that's, um, has more to do with how you identify as a filmmaker. Sure. So, you know, every, every filmmaker belongs to some group, you know, black or, you know, women or Asian or whatever it is. And the filmmakers that I know, myself included, I sort of really, really wrestle with both wanting to tell stories that reflect, you know, my experiences, my identity, my community, um, and at the same time, not wanting to be solely defined or reduced to being defined as a black filmmaker or a fill in the blank filmmaker, you know, but mm -hmm. just the right and the respect to just be a filmmaker. I'm curious about your process. Do you wrestle with that? Um, I, you know, honestly, not really. I think. Okay, it's just me. All right, no, let's no, move no, on no. to the next I, question. <laughs> I think it's. I think partially, I, I mean, usually when people ask, like, well, what kind of films do you make? I usually say, oh, I make a lot of independent and queer films. It's how I usually describe it. And I, I almost see them going hand in hand, like those, those concepts. And I think maybe that's why I'm comfortable with it, because I love the idea of saying I'm an independent filmmaker in the sense of I'm not, I'm not asking permission from anyone to make a film. I'm just going to make it, you know? And I feel, for me, that kind of bleeds into the same idea of, like, a queer identity. It's like I'm not going to compare myself to something. I'm just going to tell you this is, this is how it is. Um, and, and so for me, that struggle there, it's interesting because I think um, a lot of the times people will ask me, oh, well, are you making films for queer audiences? Are you making films for LGBT audiences? And I say, yes, but I'm making films for all audiences, right? Because I, I do think there is something that everyone can take away from it, um, whether it be something that no one, you know, for someone to see that they haven't, you know, seen a person like this or thought about it, or someone who is in that community but hasn't thought about it in that way. Um, or, I don't know, I, I, and if anything, I think there's actually an added benefit to it because I think there's additional interest uh, that can be placed on the film. At least that's the way I would like to think about it, right? I would love to think that everyone in the world is interested in seeing <laughs> LGBT content and everyone who's LGBT, you know, would love to see the content as well. So I'm going to take it from that position. And I think a lot of that has to do with considering myself an independent filmmaker. You know, I have to ultimately please myself as well as other people. So here, here's the um, last question I want to ask you, and then I want to open it up to the audience here, who I know is r really uh, anxious to, to ask you some questions. Um, but PJ, I, I don't know if you realized it, but you are on a panel with, you know, myself excluded here as the moderator, with women, right? And which is also something that is absent from your film. And, I mean, in terms of sort of a, 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 a dominant voice, yeah. right? And 
I'm sh I, I don't, you know, I understand how these things work. Maybe you were working with someone and it didn't work out, or you tried and it didn't work out, or you just, you, you know, you just said, this is what I want to do. This is what sort of compels me. I wonder if you can sort of address that, and I'm also curious about the panelists, um, what your take and observations are. Like, I mean, that must have been something that stood out to you. Mm -hmm. And as policy makers, people who are sort of trying to influence policy and you're looking for material that you were talking about, the, the, you know, the numbers and the data are what get you know, the decision makers to move and the personal story. If you're presenting a personal story that is devoid of having that sort of representation, mm -hmm. is, I'm curious what your reaction is to that as well. Sure. Um, for me, when I, when I started finding the characters for the film, um, I pretty much cast a wide net. At first, I, you know, I wasn't looking for anyone in particular. I just wanted to go out there and meet people in the community and see who would ever pique my interest and for whatever reason start filming them. Um, and the way that the film unfolds is actually the way that I met each of the characters. So the very first character I met was Dennis. Um, and I met him, you know, the same way I, I found him at Rainbow Vista and discovered Rainbow Vista the same way he did, um, was through the internet and found him there, um, and then quickly began filming him in Florida. Um, and from that point on, I knew that I wanted to make a film with more than one character. Um, and, a, and there was a lot of interest in terms of should there be, you know, a lesbian character, should there be a trans character should, you know, there's so many possibilities. And I think as a filmmaker, I personally come from the point that I think it's impossible for me, um, and nor am I actually interested in creating a piece that speaks for an entire community. I don't think it's possible. Um, because then I could easily say, well, where's the Asian lesbian in there? Or where, you know, that doesn't speak to my experience, you know, and it's, everyone has their own experience. So what I really wanted to do was just find three people whose experiences um, I just was very intrigued by. And it so happened to be men. And, and at some point I had two of the characters, you know, I had met two of the characters and I was filming Dennis and Ty and the third character was really in question for a while because Robert was the last one that I filmed. Um, and I did, I wrestled with it again, and then when I found Robert, it made sense to me, and then I actually was very happy with the fact that it was three men, and I don't know, there was something there where I felt like it made it more cohesive for me, because I didn't feel like I was trying to represent too large of a community, I was looking a little bit more specific, and I think somewhere in being very, very specific, it becomes even more general, if that makes sense. I don't know if that makes any sense, but... We'll find out. Yeah. Um, for me, I didn't really see it as being sort of abnormal, because for my, from the, um, the lesbian, gay uh, stories that I have heard my life, throughout my life, have been female-oriented. So I'm used to hearing the, the female side of, side of the story. Um, so getting the male perspective, I thought, to me, was a little bit more enlightening for me. Um, I don't know if this is true for everybody, but I, t I tend to find that as far as, you know, sex is concerned or sexual things of a sexual nature, you hear more of the female side of it, and that seems a little bit more, I don't want to say accepted, but it seems a little bit more normal so, than, say, on the male side of it. Um, you know, when, uh, I forget who was talking about the sexual revolution, um, at the time, like when you see images of it and you see people talk about it, you see a lot of women. Um, it's a little bit more accepted to see women and women than it is to see men together. So I thought that was a nice thing to actually see three men talking about their stories and their experiences and having it be three elderly men I thought was even that much more important and that much more needed to be stated as opposed to having a female in there. So. Mm. It, it was definitely something that I noticed in the film. Um, I've already explained my positionality and my background coming from a family of lesbians. Um, so, of course, that was on my mind. And I, I think since, I, I, guess I'll, I guess I'll say a little bit of what we've found in research um, and, and some of the data that we have and also the stories that I have heard um, specifically about women and some differences, I think, between LGBT older women and um, LGBT older men. And one of them is that a lot of women um, in, this, in this age group, and still in my own generation for sure, um, 
we earn less money, and it's a lot of women in this generation didn't have jobs if they were heterosexual and of a certain economic class. And so there are different economic pieces, socioeconomic pieces, different social pressure pieces that lesbian women of a certain age group are facing that, that gay men of this age group I don't think are facing in the same way. And so that's, that's one piece that I think is just interesting to share. And if anyone has any more questions about that, I'd love to talk about it. Um, and so I, I was intrigued, and this isn't a full thought, so just hear me out, but um, I'm intrigued by the, the independence that I saw from the three men in the film. And, you know, Dennis, who moves up to Oregon from Florida, I mean, that's, that's a huge move. That's amazing. And um, these men who are living in their own apartments and, you know, doing their own thing. And it's, it would be interesting to me to do a real comparison of what that independence cost or what it meant to get there. Um, and looking at a gender difference between those two things. And, and, and so I, I guess I just want to open that conversation and bring that to the table also.